Thank you, Dave, and uh, good morning, everyone. A lot of great food for thought there in Dave's session. One thing that you said they particularly resonated with me, I have to say, this thing about, you know, if you buy Lego and forever after you get recommended Lego. Some of you may be familiar with a, a service called the Cloud Player, uh, whereby essentially everything that you ever bought on CD now gets made available to you in digital form on the cloud and you can uh, stream it and listen to it whenever you want. Great service, really like it. Trouble was, my wife once persuaded me against my better judgment to buy a Ronin Keating record. <laughs> And there it is, there's Ronan in my record collection, a permanent and eradicable blot in that list of albums that I bought. Dave, they've got to fix that. So the other thing that Dave said that I thought was particularly uh, useful for the context of what I want to talk about this morning was this link between um, mobility and the cloud. So I spend most of my time in IDC um, thinking about and researching what mobility means. But mobility in the cloud uh, for IDC are two um, pillars of what we see as no less than a transformation in enterprise IT. We think that we are in the beginning of an era in which we're moving towards we, what we call the third platform of enterprise IT. The second platform being client server and the first platform being mainframe terminal. And what's really key to understand about this third platform is that the patterns of adoption are going to be completely different. <laughs> In the client server era, based on PCs connected over LANs, first of all, and later on connected by the internet, people came across this technology in their working lives, first of all. They came across personal computers, the internet, the World Wide Web, email, in their offices. And they started gradually to understand what these things could do, how powerful they were, how they could help them perhaps in their personal lives. And when these things became more affordable, they started to buy them. So we had this direction of adoption from work to the personal life. What's happening in the third platform era, this mobile and cloud era, is exactly the opposite. People have these things available to them as individuals first. These things being smartphones and tablets, apps and mobile broadband. People can already afford these things. So they know how powerful they are before they start using them in work. People are using these things to transform the way they do their everyday lives, the way they bank, the way they shop, the way they interact, the way they socialize. And then people take these things to work. And that's where the damage starts to happen if IT isn't careful. Because they do it in an unstructured, informal way, sometimes they do it in a way that IT doesn't even know about. And even when they do know about it, there's very little they can do about it. Stopping things like, for example, uh, putting corporate data into cloud storage on an ad hoc basis, which is unsecure. Things like putting corporate data on your device and then leaving it in the back of a taxi. Things like tweeting remarks which are pernicious, perhaps libelous, under a company account name. So the first phase of mobility in the enterprise, and we're still to some extent in that phase, has been all about really damage limitation. It's been about mitigating the risks that employees expose the organization to when they bring these powerful mobile technologies into their working lives. I want to say a little bit particularly before we get onto devices about the connectivity because sometimes connectivity is a bit of a Cinderella when we talk about mobility. It's taken as a given to, to a large extent. 4G LTE is a really key shift in mobility. Yes, 4G is faster than 3G, and to some extent that gets you to understand what it's about, but it's much bigger than that. 4G, as well as having faster data rates, uh, has a much lower latency. That means the round trip time that takes data to get from you back to you over the network. Uh, it's an all IP network. It's a data network for the first time in mobile, which is a key difference between that and 3G. 3G, of course, has circuit switch channels in it. So for the first time, we have a pure data network. And for the first time, uh, we have a mobile technology which has been adopted globally, albeit on different frequencies, but as a standard by all the major operators of the world. So that's something which you know, really holds out a lot of promise uh, for the enterprise IT people. From the point of view of users, it's much more simple. 4G is something that behaves like your desktop connection. For the first time, you use 4G the thing you realize straight away is, this is like my desk. It's fast, it's instant, it's responsive. And so people start to use the network in a different way 
when they have a 4G connection. Trouble is that so far, in Europe at any rate, uh, 4G has largely been, again, a consumer-first phenomenon. Most 4G subscribers at the moment are consumers. Businesses have yet to start picking up 4G in a concerted way, and that's a pity, because if businesses start to adopt 4G more concertedly, um, operators start to make more money out of it. And if they make more money out of it, they're more inclined to invest in their networks and make the networks better so that enterprises get still more value out of them. So you get, if you're lucky, a virtuous circle of adoption and investment. But we're not there at the moment because mostly businesses are still taking a somewhat uh, wait and see, somewhat standoffish approach to 4G adoption. But there are some um, early verticals that we're finding in our research that uh, are already starting to realize the benefits of 4G. So for example, uh, TV broadcasters are uh, using it quite extensively across Europe now as an alternative to satellite for outside broadcasting. It's flexible and it's cheaper. Medical in particular, you can now start to transmit uh, diagnostic quality images over the mobile network, which means that uh, when a paramedic's on site attending to an accident, you know, they can uh, take a picture and send it back to a specialist at the hospital who can recommend treatment there and then. So those are just two examples of a much wider range uh, of benefits that 4G connectivity can offer to enterprises. Coming out of the devices aspect of mobility, we hear a lot about BYOD, bring your own device, this phenomenon whereby, well, all right, if people are going to bring their own devices and use them at work, we'll make that formal. We'll bring some policies and frameworks and, and systems in place uh, that can control that, that, that can uh, you know, at least limit the damage and perhaps even exploit that in, in the enterprise. BYOD is taken off to quite a large extent in the US. And for a while, uh, it looked as though it was going to be vogue in Europe as well. What we're showing here is the results of our most recent edition of a six monthly survey that we carry out uh, of European enterprises. And one of the things we ask them about is BYOD. So we say, you know, do you have uh, formal policies in place to allow your employees to bring their own devices and use them at work? And about a third of them do. That doesn't mean the whole enterprise, of course. It could be just a few employees. But at least to some extent, about a third of enterprises say that they have some form of BYOD in place. And about another quarter say they intend to do that uh, over the next 18 months. What I find really interesting about this finding is when I compare it with the same question a year ago, <coughs> the percentage of, of enterprises that do not plan to have BYOD is about the same. Some of those quarter that said yes a year ago have now put those plans in place. They've come to fruition. But what we're not seeing is a significant amount of new companies intending to adopt BYD. We think this is the first data confirmation that we have of something we're also hearing anecdotally, which is actually European employees don't like BYD so much as American employees. There are a number of reasons for that. There's a kind of a cultural expectation here that you expect your employee, uh, your employer, I beg your pardon, to provide you with the tools that you need to do your job. You don't expect to have to buy them yourself. Another reason why BYOD is perhaps less uh, popular here is that some of the most popular devices, one of the reasons that people want to bring their own devices is because they want a particular device that's popular. Some of those devices are now being provided by enterprises. And so if your, enterprise, if your employer is going to give you that device, your desire to bring your own goes away. And also, when people actually come up against what's involved in bringing their own device and using it to, uh, for work in a, in a formal way, they start to become a bit less keen, you know, having literally to sign forms in some cases, having to have parts of the device which are under your control are parts which are not under your control, people start to find that quite cumbersome, quite onerous sometimes. So for all those reasons, what we're actually seeing in Europe now is an increasing preference for CYOD, choose your own device, whereby the employer has a list of devices from which the employee can select the one that they want. The list, of course, varies according to role, but, and there are a lot of other variations of the model, but in principle, what this is, is a gravitation 
of the selection and procurement of mobile devices back away from the employee, back towards the corporate IT department, which has some big implications for future patterns of adoption. What all this adds up to, we think, is the cusp of a transition from an early phase of mobility, this consumerization-based phase of mobility, in which essentially the objective has been to manage the risks of mobility, and towards a second phase where increasingly mobile is seen not as an auxiliary, not as something which gives you access to your systems when you can't access them in the way you really want to do, which is from your desktop. Rather, in this phase, mobile devices and networks are treated as the primary access mode for IT systems. That's a fundamental shift away from traditional development paradigms. And in terms of motivation, the big difference between the consumerization and the mobile first phases is that it's no longer about managing the risk, it's about exploiting the benefit of mobility. It's about making mobile not, not something that's happening to you, but something that works for you as an organization. Of course, things are not that simple in reality. Um, there's a wide amount of, of variation in, uh, in what companies are actually doing. In mobility. So in order to try and make some sense of that in our research, uh, IDC has developed what we call our mobile maturity model in which we, uh, we define essentially five broad stages of maturity characterized by various things. And of course, this is just a summary here. Uh, there's a lot more where that came from, I'm afraid. But fundamentally, what we're talking about here is a spectrum between uh, the least mature phase of mobility in which essentially IT is reacting to what's happening. You know, they're fixing problems in which mobility developments, if they happen at all in the IT department, don't happen in a coordinated way. And in fact, more often, mobility developments tend to happen not from the IT department, from line of business departments, such as marketing, people who understand what they want to do with mobile and are getting uh, little cooperation from IT, but they have the budget and the expertise to go ahead and do it themselves. So in that least mature phase, things tend to be very uncoordinated, therefore very inefficient. And the focus tends to be very much on the devices in that ad hoc phase. Mobility pretty much means devices from the point of view of planning and development. And at the other end of the scale, we have the most mature enterprises, of which, of course, there are very few right now, who are in this mindset that I described just now of mobile being the primary platform for IT, not the auxiliary, but the main means of, of, of accessing, um, accessing IT systems. In this phase, companies are thinking about retiring client server. They're thinking about mobile superseding client server development. And they're not thinking about how to limit the risks of mobility, but they're thinking about how to firstly exploit the benefits of mobility. More importantly still, they're thinking about how to build and sustain advantage against their competitors by using mobility. And that leads naturally to a migration away from a focus on devices to a focus on applications. Because fundamentally, devices are not a source of competitive advantage. The same devices I can buy, my competitors can buy. Competitive advantage comes from what you do with those devices. And what you do with them is what we call applications. So naturally, as companies migrate up this spectrum of maturity. The focus of development shifts away from devices, not entirely of course, but it's not the main focus. The main focus becomes the applications. So all that's a little bit abstract um, and so I thought I'd at this point uh, introduce a couple of examples of what companies are doing as they try to move up to these more mature phases of mobility. And these come from uh, the white paper that I Research and, and wrote recently, which you will have a copy of. So uh, there's a good deal more detail in there uh, if you're interested in checking them out. But essentially, I wanted to point out two of these. Uh, one is a professional services firm. And one of the key things about a mature approach to mobility is there's a strategy. Duh. But actually, this is not common still. 
mobility still tends to be tactical more than strategic. So companies that actually have a strategy, better still, one that the IT department sets, start to indicate that they're becoming a bit more mature in their approach. The principal goal of mobility is not related to technology. It's related to the business. It's to do something which is fundamentally of benefit to the business, not a technological issue. In this case, the company's most expensive asset is its people, so it wants to make the most out of them because it's all about the margin. And so it's using mobility to make its people more flexible in the hope and expectation that they'll work longer hours. Very simple. As I said, a focus on applications rather than devices, uh, a key characteristic. In this case, the application is the one which enables people to record how they're spending their time so that the company can immediately and in real time bill the client for their time. And there's no BYOD. The company does allow some of its employees to use their own devices, uh, but it minimizes the extent to which that happens by the simple device of not supporting them. Uh, most people want their IT department to support the devices, so they use the one that the IT department gives them. Second example is one of the regional NHS trusts. Uh, and again, it's talking about using mobility for a strategic reason, not for a tactical reason. In this case, the strategy is get more budget. And the way it's getting more budget primarily is by increasing the productivity of its clinicians. It's very simple. If you can use mobility to enable your clinicians to see one more patient per day, that translates directly into ROI, which you can take back to the source of your budget as evidence that you're, you're spending the, uh, the, the, the budget well. It also has other objectives, which is perhaps less easily to quantify directly, like improving the quality of care and, and make data recording more accurate because you do it on site and in real time rather than trying to remember later on when you get back to your desk. Again, applications rather than devices, the key feature. The first project that this trust rolled out was a, a scheduler for its uh, home nurses, which just made it quicker and easier to find out where they have to go next. <coughs> remember, one more appointment per day, productivity. And now it's adding some e-prescribing and ward management systems as well. Again, no BYOD. In this case, uh, the trust reported very little demand for BYOD. And uh, once uh, somebody is interested in BYOD, uh, they show them the forms, and, and that very quickly puts them off. So, and this is another um, set of data from the survey that I referred to earlier that we carried out every six months, where we ask, what is the most pressing concern is, and by the way, this is a survey of IT people, CIOs. What is your most pressing concern when it comes to mobility? And devices still come top. It's still about managing devices, but only just. And what comes second, and again, this is an indication that companies are starting to become more mature in their approach to mobility, is how to make it work with what I've got already. Now, if you're doing a point mobility project, you don't have that problem. It just lives in isolation. It doesn't have to work with the directories with all of the other stuff you've got at the back end. But when you start thinking about mobility as part of your mainstream IT development, then very quickly you come up against this problem of compatibility with what you've got already. So firstly, that indicates to us that enterprises are becoming more mature in their adoption because it comes second. Secondly, it illustrates that one of the main things that companies are looking for when they select the mobile platform, and remember, it's not BYOD, it's CYOD, the company selects. One of the main things they're looking for is compatibility. And there's a number of aspects to this. Firstly, compatibility, as I said, with what you've got in place already, with the devices that are on your desktop, you know, with the application software, with the infrastructure software that you're already running and you don't want to junk. You, know, you want a device which works with those things comparatively easily, rather than one which takes a lot of heavy lifting and a lot of reinvestment to make work with those things. Secondly, it's about the skill sets of your people. Do they have to learn new programming languages? Do they have to learn new frameworks? Or can they reapply the programming skill sets that they have already to the new technology that you're adopting on the mobile side? Obviously, the latter being preferable. 
from the end user point of view, do they have to relearn everything? Do these things work in a completely different way from the devices they're accustomed to and the applications they're accustomed to already? Or do they work in a similar way? Is it something you can put in the user's hand and say, oh yeah, I know how this works, because they already learned how to use it on, on a different device. You know, if you can do that, you're halfway there. Otherwise, you've got a lot of re-education and a lot of investment to, to, to carry out. And there's the procurement side of things. You've already got suppliers for those things you have in place. Can you use the same suppliers for your mobile devices? And can you therefore leverage those existing relationships to get better deals when you're procuring those devices? So compatibility with what you've got already, a key concern of IT departments when they're looking for a device platform. Not the only concern, of course. Other particularly important criteria uh, that we came, come across in our research when we ask this question are security, of course. Um, and we find, by the way, that security tends to come second in these surveys only when cost comes first. These are in no particular order. Cost, manageability of the system, uh, particularly in terms of compatibility with, with MDM products. Regional support, particularly for international organizations, of course, you know, the extent to which uh, they don't have to deal with different suppliers in different countries but have a single pane of glass approach to support. And perhaps surprisingly, but not really when you think about it, a lot of companies mention end user pull as an important criterion. So yes, the procurement is gravitating back from the end user towards the IT department, but the IT department still interested in taking into account its users' preferences. For a number of reasons, but one reason is that it just makes it easier to roll out if there isn't pushback. You know, if you're trying to get your users something, to use something that they're already fairly uh, familiar with and they already like, it's much easier to drive adoption than if you're having to do a top-down diktat. And really, this is a symptom of a bigger issue for IT, which is that they're having to transform their role. Traditionally, IT departments have all been about technology, and they've all been about control. They've been about determining and implementing technology, hopefully to benefit the organization, and controlling how the technology is used, and when it's not used, and the circumstances in which it can be used. Those things don't work in the mobile first era. You can't control what users do because they have too many options for getting around your controls. It's not motherhood and apple pie. It's not about going from control to enablement because that's the right thing to do. It's because you can't do control. If you put controls in place, there are a hundred ways that users will find to get around those controls. Better to put things in place that enable users to do what they want so they have no motivation to go around what you put in place. And moving away from a focus on technology to focus on business. Again, smacks of motherhood and apple pie, but there's a very pragmatic reason for that. And the reason for that is that IT budgets are going down and business transformation budgets are going up. So if you as a CIO are using mobility in order to address the things that the business transformation people want to do, you'll have access to budgets that you won't have access to if you're just buying kit. So that's everything I really wanted to cover in this session. Um, if I want to leave you with one message, it's this. It's a journey. Right now, a lot of enterprises are still focused on devices. They're still in that ad hoc reactive mode. But we're seeing an increasing number of UK enterprises who are now at least starting to understand that they need to use mobility to benefit the business in a more fundamental way. And they've at least started on the journey to get there. Thank you very much. <laughs>